on the 8th of December last, uh, less than a month ago, in the Algerian city of Oran, Cardinal Bechu beatified uh, 19 Catholic Christians who were martyred in Algeria between 1994 and 1996, just over 20 years ago. And seven of them were Cistercian monks. Four of them were missionaries of Africa, or white fathers. One was an Assumptionist sister. Two were members of a Spanish congregation. Two were sisters of the Congregation of Our Lady of the Apostles. One was a Marist brother. One a sister of the Little Sisters of the Sacred Heart. And one a Dominican, Pierre Clavery, who was also the Bishop of Oran. So 19 in all, six of these were women, 13 were men, 15 were French, one was of Maltese origin, one Belgian, and two from Spain. Uh, now, m many of you may remember a film that was released in 2010, directed by Xavier Beauvoir, called Of Gods and Men. It's a wonderful film. It won a prestigious prize at the Cannes Film Festival, and its subject was the last months of the lives of those seven Cistercian monks. And as a result of that film, and for other reasons as well, they're the, probably the best known of this group of 19. The, uh, but their story is an arresting one, but so is that of the others, and there's something very timely and precious here. So I just want to talk about them. I mean, this is hot off the press, if you like. These are, these are contemporary martyrs, and very recently, within the last month, uh, declared blessed by the church. It's really worth uh, highlighting these people. Now, we have to give a little bit of historical background that Algeria was a French colony from the 1830, and it gained its independence in 1962 uh, after uh, a very uh, bloody war of independence that uh, took uh, seven years between the, um, between the Algerians who wanted independence and the French who were the colonial power. I can remember when we had first had television at home uh, this, was, uh, this was on the news at the time. I was a small boy, and it was the first time I'd actually seen shooting uh, uh, and, and people falling dead uh, in, in, in the street or wounded. And I, uh, it quite shocked me as a boy to see this happening. Well, that was the Algerian War of uh, Independence. And as a result of that war, one million Europeans left Algeria. And the Algerian government that followed, it, it was a single party, uh, it was socialist, it was nationalist, and it went on for a number of years, but people felt there were injustices, there was unemployment, there was poverty, and so on, and more and more discontent. And uh, the, the, uh, the voice of that discontent became an Islamist party. And they did well in some polls, and the government cracked down on them and wouldn't allow a second poll. And at that point, th this was in the early 1990s, a civil war ensued, which ran uh, through the 1990s. And casualties on both sides, you get different figures, but was something like 200,000. Like any civil war, it was a pretty desperate thing. And in October 1993, um, after this war had been going for a year or so, the militant wing of the Islamists, the GIA, uh, told all foreigners and Christians to leave Algeria before the 1st of December, or they risk being killed. Uh, and many did. Now, the Catholic Church there was tiny, tiny. Uh, less than 1%. There were also some Protestants. Uh, but many of the, the members of the church 
did indeed leave, many of the Christians left. And those who remained uh, were uh, priests, usually religious brothers and sisters, volunteer lay missionaries. There were a few uh, Catholic Algerians, native Al Algerians who were Catholic. Uh, and there were some African students from south of the Sahara who were Catholic. They remained. But they remained, obviously, in an extremely perilous situation. And uh, even the Algerian government advised them to leave. And uh, the French Foreign Office advised the uh, French uh, citizens and Christians to leave the country. But some chose to stay. And this is where we come to the really the dramatic uh, part of this whole story, the decision to say, to stay. Now, a good spokesman here, this is where it, it really is fascinating, is uh, Pierre Claverie, the, who, who was a Dominican and who was Bishop of Iran and who was, would be killed in 1996. And he had been brought up in a, a, a French Christian family in Algeria. He had grown up in Algeria in the colonial times. And uh, he only really realized afterwards what an isolated life uh, they, uh, his family, but the, the French people generally lived. They, they really had minimal contact with the Algerians who were all around them. They were in a separate uh, bubble of their own. And as Christians, they all knew the commandment to love your neighbor, but it never really occurred to them that their neighbor were, uh, was these people who, among whom they were living. And uh, later, after the War of Independence, his eyes were, were opened. Now, by this time, um, the, this, this, we're talking about the 60s and the 70s uh, uh, and the 80s, the Christians had very little in the way of religious freedom because preaching outside church would be disallowed, uh, probably doing something like this. Uh, that we were going out all over would be disallowed, evangelization prohibited, conversions very dangerous, very dangerous thing to um, attempt to or convert uh, a local person. And so gradually, you know, this, this circumscribed church in Algeria, just a tiny drop in a, in a great Muslim ocean, learned to redefine its mission. So here were the neighbors that Jesus was giving them, these Algerian Muslim people. What could the Christians do? They couldn't stand up and proclaim Jesus in a, in a simple and straightforward way, but they could befriend them. They could get to know them. They could try to understand their faith. Um, many of them would read the Quran and try to, to understand what made the Muslims tick. They could offer services. One of them, uh, Murdered sisters, for example, taught Algerian women embroidery for years. Another was a nurse. Uh, another cared for disabled children. Another for the elderly. The Maris brother uh, had taught mathematics for years. The Cistercian monks, who were in a remote part of the country near the Atlas Mountains, uh, they shared the, the, the joys and sorrows of the villagers around them. They helped them medically as they could. One of the monks had... Uh, was a doctor. They entered into religious dialogue with some of them. They just shared their, their life. And these were the, uh, the appropriate forms of the church's mission in this place. It, so it was a Christ, it was inspired by Christ, obviously, but these were Christian people. And it meant presence, it meant the gift of themselves to this person. This wasn't a church that was sort of turned in on itself and simply preoccupied with itself. Uh, it meant solidarity, it meant accompaniment, it meant prayer. And, and this really became, as it were, the philosophy of, of the, the Catholic community in Algeria. Well, then came, in the late 80s and early 90s, the rise of Islamism and the civil war. And then came the threat. If you don't want to be killed, get out. And most of the laity, naturally, because they had their, their children to think of, uh, did leave. But the priests and religious were freer. 
And all of those who would be killed, and the others too, who, who weren't, but, uh, but survived, all of them opted to stay. And some did so simply, just said, well, I've been doing, I've been working with and for these people all my life, I'm just going to go on, never mind the circumstances. For other people, it was, it was something that, that they really had to think about, deliberate upon. Uh, the film about the Cistercian monks it captured very well the discussions within the community, and so that it was actually a community decision to stay in the end. They all, they all came together, they discussed, there were different points of view. Some said, no, we should go. Uh, others said, no, we should stay, and so on. And they, they came to this consensus to, to stay. And uh, they stayed because they wanted to be with their neighbors that they had come to love. And for many in Algeria, many Algerians, life was very far from good anyway. There was a lot of poverty, a lot of unemployment, general wretchedness. Uh, and then after the outbreak of the Civil War, it became worse. So there was always the threat of, of, of violence, either from the extremists or from the, the army, reprisals from the government. But these Christians chose to stay. And uh, one of the monks uh, said, well, maybe the, the leader of the, uh, the GIA, the armed Islamists, yes, maybe he will take my life, but my life is already given. I've already made this choice. Uh, and they were living out, this is why perhaps it's worth talking about them at this time of year, they were living out the logic of Christmas, the logic of the incarnation, God with us, the defenseless child in the manger. And uh, the government had told them, we can't protect you. But also what, what moved them and, and confirmed those who did decide to stay was that so many of the Algerians said, please stay. We don't want you to go. You are a comfort to us. You have shown us your presence. You have shown us such great love. Don't leave us in this bad time. Uh, one of them said, uh, if you leave us, you deprive us of your hope and you take away our hope. And one man said uh, to, to the monks, uh, you are the branch, and we are the, the birds that, that settle on the branch. If the branch is cut off, we're in trouble. Uh, and on the other side, one of the monks wrote, how can we call ourselves the Church of Algeria if we don't share the history of this bruised and battered people? So the 19 who died paid the price of this choice, if you like their Christmas, became Good Friday, just as the childhood of the Son of God became the cross. Uh, it, this could come quite randomly, but seven of the monks were abducted and later beheaded. Most of the uh, other victims were gunned down by the insurgents in different circumstances, different situations. Two of the sisters, for example, returning from mass. They were just walking back from mass to, to their house when gunmen appeared and shot them. Another one, uh, another couple were killed on the way to mass. Um, and the, bush, the bishop uh, and his Muslim driver were uh, blown to pieces in their car. Now, I'd just like to quote um, from the last homily that this bishop, Pierre Claverie, gave. Uh, it's uh, very revealing. It was prophetic. He must have had an intimation of what was going to happen to him. But he says this. Uh, Since the beginning of the Algerian drama, I have often been asked, uh, what are you doing there? Why do you stay? Uh, shake the dust off your feet. Come home. Home. But where are we at home? We are here because of the crucified Messiah for no other reason and because of no other person. We have no interest that we want to safeguard. We have no influence we want to maintain. Uh, we are not driven by any kind of masochistic uh, or suicidal desire. We, ha we have no power, but we are there. It's like being at the bedside of a friend of 
uh, a sick brother or sister in silence, holding their hand, mopping their brow. It's because of Jesus. It's because of him who is suffering here in this violence, crucified again in the flesh of thousands of innocent people. Like Mary, his mother, and St. John, we are there at the foot of the cross where Jesus is dying, abandoned by his own and mocked by the crowd. Isn't it vital for the Christian to be present in these places of suffering, in these places of forsakenness and of abandonment? Where would the church of Jesus Christ, which is itself the body of Christ, be if it wasn't in this kind of place? I believe the church will die from, for not being sufficiently close to the cross of its Lord. However paradoxical it may sound, St. Paul explains it very well. The strength, the vitality, the hope, the fruitfulness of the church come precisely from there, from the cross, uh, through no other way, from no other place. All the rest is just dust for the eyes, is just worldly illusion. The church would deceive herself and would deceive the world if she presents herself as one power among others, or even as a humanitarian organization, or as some great spectacular evangelical movement. She might shine, but she would not burn with the fire of the love of God, which is stronger than death, as the Song of Songs says because this is what it is about. It is about love, love first and love alone, a passion which Christ has given us a taste for and shown us the way to follow. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Now, part of the fascinating story of, of uh, that man who was, who was um, blown to bits in his car not long afterwards is his driver because his driver was a young Muslim called Muhammad, appropriately, and who was devoted to him. In earlier years, uh, Muhammad's family had been helped by Christians, and he hadn't forgotten that. And he was warned, look, you are being friendly with a Christian. Your, your life is in danger. Watch it. And he said, no, I'm sorry. This man, this man is my friend, and I will remain with him. And he has been a friend to me. And anticipating the worst, he even wrote a very uh, moving, simple, final testament. And he was loyal to this friendship. So their blood symbolically mingled in, in the car when it was blown up. And he has sometimes been called the 20th martyr of these 19, the 20th. So the whole story, those are just some bits of it. I do recommend that you watch the film of Gods and Men. It's, it's, it's a wonderful film. But uh, the whole story is pregnant with, with meaning because it, it's very beautiful to, to see how the community at Tiberin, the name of the monastery, came precisely as a community to the decision to remain. And this is paralleled uh, by what seems a, a shared attitude on the part of the church in Algeria and those especially dedicated to her mission. There's a real... Uh, showing forth epiphany of, of what a local church is. There was a common mind. We will remain. We will stick with this crucified people who, unaware though they might be of it, were enduring a version of Christ's passion. And uh, those especially sensitive who, to, to interreligious dialogue, shall we say, to establishing relations with Muslims as Muslims, never did so from anything but a Christian perspective. Though I think this story goes far beyond sort of Christian, Christian Muslim relations, interesting though that may be. I think it offers a great deal to, to church, to local churches in other situations across a whole range of circumstances. It's like uh, the beatification is bringing the gift from one, one place, uh, from the local church in Algeria. Uh, is bringing that gift to the attention of the whole church. And wherever a local church is small and seems circumscribed in her mission by a kind of impenetrable wall that you can't get through to get out to people, here, here is a way. I think this story implies 
a whole spirituality, a way of being Christian and Catholic and the church in contemporary circumstances, of being with others for God. It's so simple, so simple. It's ancient, but it's new. Uh, and you could say it, it is interesting, too, that uh, it, it, it does say also something about the mission of consecrated people, because it was consecrated people, it was the religious, it was the celibates who remained behind and suffered death. So that, that shows uh, the, 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 the deepest meaning, in a way, of, of, say, the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, the way, the way of the vowed life or the dedicated life, is precisely that it gives you a, the freedom to go the whole way, um, a, and freedom to follow the Lamb wherever he goes, freedom to love to the end. I've drawn the parallel between Christmas and Easter, if you like, Christmas and Good Friday, the Incarnation and the Cross, and, and the journey, the trajectory that these disciples of Christ followed. But perhaps we might ask, perhaps a question arises here, is there any glimpse of the resurrection? Was, was it worth it? Was, it? was it just a futile gesture, this? Was it just something imposed upon them? Did these deaths have any effect? Well, we mustn't expect, you know, mass conversions or some suddenly Algeria becomes, you know, rapidly Roman Catholic or Islamic fundamentalism uh, just disappears. Uh, though the first ceasefire did come in 1997, the year after the, those last martyrdoms. But we must look elsewhere. I think the effect is in the very testimony itself because the, 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 the gesture, the offering of their lives that these people made, that has its own eloquence because love is what love is when it's real. It, it survives the brutality. Uh, it speaks to those who hear the story. It spreads by in, inspiration. The beatification is like almost like a loudspeaker, which, which is projecting this small voice uh, outwards and onwards but it will always be a hidden process. Uh, Tertullian famously says the blood of martyrs is the seed of, of, of Christians, but seed is something small. Seed is something that goes into the ground. Uh, a seed is not a tsunami. And the, the postulator for the cause has pointed out a very interesting thing, that the reputation for holiness, which is required for these causes, is found among many non-Christian Algerians also. Many people wrote letters to, to the bishop or to whoever, uh, to their Christian friends after some of these murders. Uh, there are very thoughtful Algerian Muslims who are, are aware that these people, uh, these were people who loved them disinterestedly and gave their lives for them. One woman wrote, says, we realize God wants the Christian church to be in our country. And uh, now many people visit this monastery of Tiberine, down by the Atlas Mountains, uh, a, a place of pilgrimage, and 90% of those who do are Muslim. And the respect and friendship that these witnesses gave was often immediately reciprocated, like in the story of the driver, Muhammad, these underground, seed-like things, things of the heart. Love digs, said one of the monks. Attitudes change, intimations of resurrection, the new order. So who is my neighbor, asked the scribe of Jesus. So illumined by Jesus' good Samaritan, these people also ask him this question. Who is my neighbor? and like their many followers in similar situations around the world. And they answered thoughtfully, freely, humbly with their whole life. So Jesus' words, go and do likewise, seem to ring out again. <laughs>